Okay, today is uh, May 21st, 2014. We're here with Mr. Wonderlick, and we're at his home at 2800 Baird Park, Evansville, Indiana. And uh, we're interviewing Mr. Wonderlick uh, because he was a member of our armed services in World War II. And he's going to talk about where he grew up in Evansville, and then a little bit where he went to grade school and high school, and then why he went to the war, what about his boot camp, and then what he did in World War II. Uh, Mr. Wonderlick, uh, tell me your whole name, when your birth date was, and uh, start from there. My name's Lewis Melton Wonderlick. My birthday's 11-11-24. And uh, you were born in Evansville? Born in Evansville, right. And then what street did you live on most of the time when you were a little kid? Ferris Avenue in Illinois. Ferris in Illinois. That's near the down downtown. Well, near no, near Oak Hill, Oak Hill Cemetery in a way. Yes. Rosedale. Rosedale. So it's Rosedale. Yeah. Okay. And then, Mr. Wonderlick, uh, what grade school did you go to and what high school? Went to Hardrusa Grade School and Bossy High School. When did you graduate from Bossy High School? 1948. 48. Okay. So then, tell us why you got into World War II and what you did in World War II. Well, I was drafted in World War II. Drafted in World War II, and I went to the basic training in the tank destroyers. Left there and went to uh, mountain climbing infantry. Went on maneuvers, and went over, overseas from there to France. When did you get to France? About what is that in 44 or 43? 44. 44. And, and uh, where did you go do that basic training? Where was that basic training in the United States? you remember where that was? Camp Carson, Colorado. So you got there by train or plane? Train. Was it crowded on the train? Yeah, plenty. And how long were you at Camp Carson? Uh, six, six months. And what did they teach you? How to run a tank or? No, I was at a half track pulling a gun, you know. Lo, uh, so seven. pull it, you call it a chemical battalion where you pull a gun and shoot the shoot sort of a cannon? Yeah. It, yeah. They towed on a half track. I forget what millimeter it was, but it was a large gun. Pretty good size, size of your yeah. fist. Shoot like a, yeah. a pretty big bullet out there. Yeah. And so you had to pull that gun. You had to pull the bullets too. You couldn't carry the bullets, they were too big. No. They were like uh, like came out of a out of a tank. They were yeah. pretty good size. Yeah. They were 80 millimeters, 120 millimeters. My uncle was in the Battle of the Bulge, and he had 120 millimeter. But they were so big, the human yeah. being could hardly carry them. I mean, you could put it, you could load them, and then shoot them. Did you practice shooting them out in Camp Carson? No, we didn't shoot the big guns much. But they sh gave you safety safety uh, classes and things, so you didn't kill yourself. Yeah, they all oh, they had all kinds of safety classes. Yeah. Were you U.S. Army? Yes. Uh huh. And uh, you wore a, what kind of uniform did you wear? Just a regular khaki and regular O.D. dress. You know. uh -huh. Then when did you arrive to Europe? About what date? Do you remember the date? And how did you get over to Europe? By what kind of ship? And where did you go? Which what port did you leave the United States? I left New York. I don't know what port it was. We went through England and just overnight, and then to France on a LCI, and I joined. The, must have got there somewhere around the, the last part of June, first part of July. June first part of July of forty four. Forty four, right. So D Day was June sixth of forty four. Right. Forty four. So you got there a little bit after that. A yeah. little bit after D Day. And now we, what kind of ship uh, transported from New York? Was it not a military ship, it was just a no, transport it's ship? It's a U.S. Billy Mitchell. Billy Mitchell. Yeah. Was it a very big ship to hold 100 people? Large ship, large ship. 500 troops on there? Oh, more than that. All troops? All men? All army, yeah. All army. Yeah, except for, might have been a few naval on there. But. And you got fed on there and they had yes. all, everything yeah. for you. How were you scared going over there? No, not 
Well, Larry, but yeah, we was in a big convoy. Yes. And then when you land, you joined one day in England, then they got you on that LCI and crossed the English Channel, and then you landed right at Normandy? Yeah. And what, what did the port look like at Normandy? Had they built, they had these things called mulberries out there to prevent the bad weather or prevent the bad waves. How did you get on the beach? That thing got you about 100 or 10 feet, 20 feet from the shore, or how close did it get there? That's uh, best I can remember, about 50 feet or so. And did you about sink when you got in there with your, you are up to your waist deep in water, weren't you, when you got off? Uh, well, it didn't seem to me like it's quite that deep. Uh -huh. It's been a lot, I don't remember a lot of that. It's been a long time ago, and you literally watched them for everything. You, know. you had your whole pack on your back? Yeah. They weren't shooting at you then much? No. No, they was in far enough. They could shoot there, but they, the particular time we landed, they weren't shooting there. You were probably about June 10th then, about D-Day plus four or something like that? No, longer than that. D-Day plus 10 or 20? The, the 28th, I'm pretty sure. What okay, was. yeah. So they were at St. Lowell. They were further inland, and you were the yeah. backup troops. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, come, I went in as a replacement. I see. Did you see a lot of torn up things on the Normandy beach? You saw ships that were torn up and well, all kinds of things that... There were scuttled ships from the French fleet there. Uh, yeah. Did you land at Utah Beach or Omaha or somewhere near there? I yeah. didn't really pay attention. Uh -huh. Now after you landed, then they got you on, on trucks or jeeps or trains or did you walk all the way? Well, they trucked us part of the way. Uh -huh. I joined that outfit around Cherbourg. Cherbourg, uh huh. Yeah. Cherbourg's an important place. Cherbourg, I think, was down in France where they had the great big castle there on the, yeah. the great big castle on the shore. Yeah. That was a nice port there. And that's where you joined, and then you got in a truck, and they got you part of the way there. Oh, yeah. No, most of the time was movement, you know, on foot. Yes. But, uh, if they action got too far away they trucked you up there but that's very seldom happened there did your feet hurt with all that walking well we walked about 10 miles one day and that not good yeah wasn't too good what kind of did you have a pistol a 45 pistol no i had a, a carbine rifle yeah car yeah small rifle uh -huh. yeah i was an ammunition barrier on a machine gun i see yeah now, well, tell me a little bit about your battles or what you went through. So you got there by June 28th, so you take you 10 days to get up to the battle area or yeah, whatever, yeah. or longer. Tell me anything about battles you remember or anything you can recall. Oh, just a, lot of t a lot of the names through there. I remember St. Lowe and you know, yes. some of the others up through there. And uh, oh, Bayon and... Yes. Yeah. Some of those smaller towns you didn't pay much attention to. You just kept going right on yeah. through. Yeah. Not a lot of skirmishes in those towns because we'd already beat some of the enemy in some of those towns. Well, yeah, some of them they were, but then some would, like uh, Bayon there, there was nobody there before we got there. I see. And so you had to capture Bayon and, and, yeah. and push the Germans out. Yeah. Uh, did anybody in your uh, platoon get killed or get hurt? Well, uh, yeah, my <clears throat> buddy got killed, but uh, didn't get killed. Got a broken leg. Shrapnel or something else? Plane strafing. Plane from the German planes yeah. coming down and getting it. Yeah. yeah. Then that's about June, so it's hot over there then, and then yeah. probably July it was hot. Yeah. August still hot, so your first two months over, you were pretty hot. Yeah, it, it was pretty good weather most of the time. You know. Uh -huh. Then you got up, then the winter, tell me about that winter, then that winter of 44 was pretty bad. That was one of the worst winters in Germany. Well, Where were you then? I got, uh, let's see, I got hit, oh, I got hit in September, and then went back to my outfit and then left. I didn't remember how cold the winter was, I didn't pay too much attention to it. How'd you get hit? Tell me how you got hit. You got hit by what? Martyr shell, mur uh, shrapnel from martyr shell. Where did it hit you? In the shoulder. Left or right? Uh, left. And uh, how did it feel when it got hit? Well, it, it didn't hurt too much. I was down the hole and it hit the hole. 
side of the hole and then just a piece of it come off and come my way. Do you still have that lead in you? No. They pulled no, it out? They took it out, yeah. Did they take you to the back of the line, to the surgeon, or did they just say, go ahead and keep fighting, or did you, how, well, what did they do to you then? No, they, uh, I went back to battalion age, you know, huh. from there to the hospital. And then the hospital wasn't in England, it was there, uh, an yeah, aid hospital, right, like a tent. Yeah. And did they pull your shrapnel out then? Oh, they'd done that before I left. Before you left? Before they left battalion aid. I see. Yeah. Then what'd they do with you? Send you back into the line or send you back no, to Europe? Sent, sent me to the hospital. In in England? No, no. In they, in battalion, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure it's best on San France, the best I can remember. Uh huh. Then how long were you in the hospital? Oh, a couple of months, anyway. Could you move your left arm? Can you move your left arm now? Oh, I'm no, no disability at all. Yeah. And uh, then what did you do after those two months in the hospital? Did you go back and fight or did they send you back to the United States? I went back to, to a replacement outfit. Then uh, later on I was sent back to the United States uh -huh. and uh, got discharged in uh, 45. I see. Tell me about the replacement outfit. Where was the replacement outfit located? I couldn't tell you. Was that in France or in yeah, Germany? in France, yeah. France, yeah. So you're just sort of occupying everything. Yeah. Um, how do you think what uh, from World War II till now? What do you think about what was in 1945, 46? What did you feel about winning that war? Did you feel good? And did you get married before the war or after the war? Get married after the war. After the war, right? You did. Yeah. What did you feel like when you came back to the United States? Did you feel like the like the uh, the whole world was different then? <laughs> It was different. Yeah. How scared were you that Hitler was going to take over and, and our Japanese were going to take over? Were you worried about all that? Well, I, I was, in a, like I say, I was in the France there and, and uh, when I come here to, back here to the hospital, uh, they had mentioned before I left I might get sent to South Pacific, but I didn't. So. So you didn't have to go well, over the war, there. War was over with with Germany, and three or four months later, so over with Japan. You know, because about May it was over with Germany, and then Japan is over in August or September. But you had three months; they'd have sent you over to Japan. If the Japanese wouldn't have given up, you would have gone over there, and we could have uh, lost you. I doubt it. I was they pretty well. I was pretty well out by then. How many years were you in the army? Two years, one month, 16 days. 16 days. So how old were you when you got in? About 19 or 18? 18. 18, yeah. And you got drafted? Drafted, right. As soon as you got out of, put out of high school, or you weren't even out of high school, were you? Uh, no, I, don't, I, I left high school, and uh, when I come back, I got my GED at, uh, in 48. That's what Central got that. Did the military pay for that? No, it wasn't that much, you know. Didn't cost, the G didn't no. cost that much, yeah. Um, what do you think we need to tell the next generation, the next two or three generations, about our freedom and about how important World War II was in saving our, our country? Well, it, it, it's something that couldn't be helped. It had to be done. That's about all you can say about it. Hitler was going too strong, and yeah. Did you ever see Eisenhower or Patton or, or Montgomery or uh, Roosevelt? No. Didn't see any of them. No, I, I had a chance to see Patton because we uh, followed the Third Army going into toward Paris, and, and uh, but he I never did see him. We was at the tail end of. He was going pretty fast, wasn't he? Yeah, he wasn't he, stopping for anything. He, he was shooting everything that moved. <laughs> <laughs> he had all those tanks. He yeah. wanted to take everything. He didn't want to stop for anything, did he? Yeah, he, he was way ahead of us because we was about a day late. Yes, yeah. Behind him. Yeah, he moved fast. Yeah. Did you talk to anybody that was in the Battle of the Bulge or any of those people over there? You didn't talk no, to any of those? No, yeah. I was just left there before the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, yeah. 
Battle of the Bulge, June, uh, December 17th through, I think, the end of January, 1744 through January 45. Um, did you ever see a German in the eye, or did you see, you know, are they younger kids you were fighting, or are they older people? Well, yeah, we've seen a lot of them, you know, but most of them were captured, but being in a heavy machine gun, you was back a little farther than the main yes. troops, so you don't, wouldn't get in any in hand-to-hand fighting, you know. Yes. If we took a town, we delivered overhead fire and all that. Uh, yes. Harassing fire. Well, for uh, this is we're going to uh, try to put this in the archives at the National Archives and the Archives of Congress and also uh, at University of Southern Indiana, just so we've got documentation. Your grandkids, your great grandkids, will want to see these things and know what you did. And uh, appreciate your time today, Mr. One Lake Lewis and. Uh, I think you did a good job and uh, appreciate your service to the country. People like you are what we call our greatest generation and uh, you just say we had to serve it, we had to do it, but it, it's a tremendous service to our country. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Okay. Before the war, Mr. Wanderlich worked at an LST factory. Evansville, Indiana had 19,000 employees at our LST factory in Evansville and his wife's father, his father-in-law also worked there, Mr. Claspell. But this uh, was one of the most important factories in Evansville. We made 167 LST. They were called cornfield LSTs. We made more in Evansville than they made anywhere in the world. Tell us what your job was there, Mr. Wonderlick. I was a young. I was an escort there. To when people come come in the shipyard there, we took them where they belong, you and see that they didn't leave, you know, and and bring them back to the gate. Now, because there's high security there. You yeah. couldn't let anybody in there that wasn't supposed to be there. And you'd walk them right to where they're supposed to be and then right back, yeah. huh? And uh, was that a pretty big place when you were there? Oh, yeah. It was about as big as it, well, about as big as it ever got, I guess. Yeah. But oh. to see those great big LSDs being made, wasn't that amazing for a oh, yeah. child of your, I yeah. mean, 17, 18, to see that? Yeah. And you saw it come up from nothing to that, wasn't yeah. it? Just amazing. All them gantry cranes and yeah. all that stuff there. Yeah, it was. Did you ever see one pushed into the water? Yeah, I think I think he won them. I think he put it on banana peelings to to push it in. Yeah, <laughs> and then they <laughs> bananas, but not peeling. And push. I think he did. I, I wouldn't bet on, but I, the rest I can remember it went down. Yeah. And when you'd sit under the next to those LSTs, they were about uh, about a three or four stories high, weren't they? Were the high looked like a high, a tall building next to you, didn't it? When they were building those. Yeah, they they were tall. You know, yes. when you walk up the side of them on dry land, you know. Yes. Yeah. Because I don't know what the, how much water they're drawing. You know. Seven feet in the back and about one and a half in the front, but that's empty. When they're full, yeah. they draw a lot more. Yeah. But. Uh, a lot of people like you, They we had, I said, 70,000 employees at the LST factories because people only worked there for a short period of time. Like you, 19,000 employees at one time, but 70,000 during World War II. So people like you would go work there for a year or six months, then you left and went to war. That happened to a lot of people where they only worked there for a year or two. The welders worked there and women that would be a waitress could get uh, triple their pay being a welder compared to being yeah. a waitress or a... Uh, you yeah, they, had, they had a lot of women welders and burners. What you see in Evansville was a busy place. It changed overnight, didn't it? I mean, it was a busy place. They made the Republic Air. I don't know if you went out there or went to Chrysler. They made the bullets. Did you see some of those things being done? Yeah, well, when I worked at International Harvester, we built an M1 rifle out there huh. right toward the end of the war was over, but they still built that M1 rifle out there. That was an important rifle in the war, yeah. and you helped build that at International well, Harvest. I wasn't in that division. I was in the refrigeration at the end of it, uh -huh. but they did build it out there. Uh -huh. That was at the where the Whirlpool is now. Yeah. Because where we made Republic, we made all these planes out there, and then they sold to International Harvester in '46, and it was International Harvester until about '56, and Whirlpool bought it. Yeah. And so you worked that big plant for a long time. Yeah, I worked out there for eight and a half years. Uh-huh. Um, 
But how did you think Evansville was during that World War II? As you a little kid, you saw all these people coming in. It was a busy place, wasn't it? Well, we had about as much war work right here as you had anyplace else. Yeah. They said it's the biggest uh, per capita work on war in World War II than anywhere in the world. Yeah. Had close to 70, 80,000 people working on the war effort. And per capita, that was bigger than anywhere in the world. More than in Germany, more than anywhere in the United States. So you were part of that. And your father-in-law, did your wife tell you what he did? What did he do there at the LST? Oh, he worked in the mold off up there at the carpenter. Uh-huh. So they molded, made the molds to build the well, steel frame of the... They, or what would the mold do? What did they do in the mold shop? Well, I uh, made patterns and all up there for different things there. And then he, I didn't know him at the time. But the, uh, oh, they'd done a lot of different things up there, you know. In fact, I get that shop mixed with the pipe shop. Which yes. Is, and they worked there all during World War II. Did he yeah. worked there the whole war, 41 all the way to 45? All, all the way in. He did, yeah, oh. yeah. And then you met your wife after the war? Yeah. You didn't know her before? Nope. Huh. And um, how'd you meet her? Uh, she was with a friend of mine, and I met her, and, uh, and things just happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of that happened after World War II. We had a lot of marriages between 45 and 47 yeah. around the United States. When did you get married? In uh, 1948. 40? 48. 48, okay. So 48, so not as heavy in the marriage as 48, but 46, they all came back from war, everybody got married, yeah. but 46 to 48 was a big time there. Yeah. What church you get married in? Uh, we got married in Morganfield, Kentucky. <laughs> Morganfield, yeah, that's right down there near uh, near uh, Breckenridge. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so you got married down there. That's pretty common. A lot of people got married yeah. different towns around here. And then you've lived in all your life most of the time, except for yeah, the war. All yeah. the time. Yeah. Well, thanks for that information. I think, uh, Lewis, it's been a great interview. And uh, that's all part of what World War II was about. Uh, his father-in-law worked there. He worked in Evansville, and then he went and worked in the, and uh, was a soldier in the war. But a very common element at that time. Thank you again, Lewis. Uh, Lewis's dad also worked for the war effort in World War II. Lewis, can you tell us what your dad did, what company he worked for, and what he did for them? Well, he worked for Servile, and he was an electrician foreman, electrical foreman, uh, for the whole plant there, you know. And Servile was real important. They made the wings for the Corsairs after the war, but during the war, they made it for the P-47. We made 6,700 P-47s in Evansville, and that was one of the, Ruthenberg owned that plant. But Cervelle was a big plant in Evansville that made the wings to those those planes and a lot of other ones. So if he was an electrician, he had to be in charge of a lot of things. He was yeah. probably a pressured job. You'd see him come home and he was stressed some. Yeah. How long did he work there the whole war? Yeah, he worked there for all the way up to 45, I think it was. He had about 30-something years there. Had he worked there before, they, before the war? Yeah, he worked. Cervelle was very important. They made a refrigerator prior to the war. It had only one moving part. It was made by gasoline would, or not gas, but gas would help uh, make the, uh, help the refrigerant. But in now, uh, in the uh, war in Iraq and Iran, these refrigerators, that type of refrigerator is very popular because you just need gas, you don't need electricity yeah. to run that. But it was, had only one moving part, it was the door. And it, it was a lot of people in Evansville had a surveil refrigerator, but it, uh, it didn't ever catch on in the United States and yeah. the world. He worked there as a refrigerator plant, and then he became part of the air, air, yeah. uh, airplane plant. Do you remember some of those plane wings being transported down the down the roads in Evansville? No, I, I think I was already in the service for a lot of that got started. Did you ever see that steel parts at the LST factory being transported around in the city? Great big things going on trucks down the road? Well, a lot of that was built right there at the plant. At the plant. Yeah. Was there a big steel factory in Evansville? I think we had Mesker Steel and International Steel, and they, they helped make a lot of that. Well, I don't really know, but I think most of it was... Brought in. Brought in. Uh, it was made right there on the... On the, on the site. My buddy was a welder there on, on that. In fact, he got burnt, and that kept him out of service. 
did his eyes, he had the guards for his eyes, didn't hurt his eyes, but he no. burned himself welding. They said the welding on the LST held up in World War II. We had very few defective ships. It's not a very thick steel on the oh, LST, sweet. but the welding held in bad typhoons in Japan and in the Atlantic Ocean, bad weather, and they held it, didn't break that ship apart. Well, again, thanks, Lewis. And it, your mother didn't work there, too, did she? No, my sister did. What did she do? Something with the wings, that's all I know. At Cervelle. So your yeah. dad probably got her the job? Yeah, yeah, probably so. Any cousins or anybody that worked in any of the factories that you know of? Well, no, not. Yeah. No, okay. I'm paying, you know. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. You've really been a, 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 a good uh person to give us information about Evansville. Thanks, Lewis. Appreciate it. There's a book on D-Day that uh, Lewis uh, Wonderlich has shown me. Book. It has Opera Operation Epson, and this is the symbol of his unit, his unit emblem. This is called the 79th Infantry Division, and that's his emblem. And uh, if you look at this map, up on the top is Cherbourg, and that's where he entered. That was a, a good port for entering France, and that's where the ship left him off. And then he, he came down to St. Lo and some other cities in France before he was wounded with shrapnel. But this is uh, the 79th uh, Infantry Division. That was their symbol. And uh, this is the city of Cherbourg where he first uh, entered the European theater. Lewis and his tank. Uh, uniform. He's age 18 in that picture. And this is a picture uh, when he's about age 19 in the army. And then this is when he met his beautiful bride, Mrs. Wonderlick. And uh, uh, this is when he's uh, about 1948 or so.